Hello everybody, welcome to this third video about abstract interpretation. In this video I will explain the mathematical foundations of the whole theory of abstract domains and abstract interpretations, and I will give some examples of such domains. But let's just recall a bit the memories. In the last episode we were representing abstract values in a concrete domain by a finite computable superset that was called an abstract value. Uh, here, if we depict the abstract single values here of the couple x and y, we have seen that we can decide to represent the red shape here as a cross product of signs or use the shape of intervals to represent all the values that are possible inside this red box. The object of this section is to define properly what is an abstract domain and what is a legal abstract domain. Let's now come to definitions. An abstract domain defines a set of abstract elements and a set of abstract operations that morally represent the counterpart of the concrete operations in the concrete world inside the abstract world. We define two maps, which are alpha and gamma, which permits to map any concrete object to an abstract object and the converse which is a concretization function which is usually defined and denoted by gamma which maps the, the abstract object to the largest concrete object it approximates. We often do this kind of schemes in order to depict the abstract world and the concrete world I recall what we did in the first two videos, we depict in dark grey the set of concrete values of the program. After abstract abstraction, this concrete value becomes pink. And after concretization, we are supposed to have a grey behavior that is bigger than the strong grey behavior. To define all these Bigger, we need a concrete order, which is usually the same uh, order as in sets, and an abstract order, which will be defined in the abstract world. Let's begin with completing a lattice into an abstract domain. I recall some definitions, which are usually standard in mathematics. So a lattice is a partially ordered set, where each pair of elements has a sub, denoted by union or join, and an inf denoted by intersection of meets. Beware that the intersection here is square. Usually this kind of mathematical structure is represented by a hash diagram where the biggest elements are in the upper side of the diagram and the lesser elements are in the bottom of the diagram. Each a row represents here the fact that two elements are ordered. From this lattice, we construct a Galois connection that permits to make the relationship between the concrete world and the abstract world. The abstract world would be defined by elements of this lattice, and the concrete world is as usual a power set of values. And the second step to construct the abstract domain is to construct abstract transfer function that should be sound. Okay, so there are basically two main structural properties to ensure the fact that our abstraction and concretization is a Galois connection, which means that somehow they commute and there is a soundness for designing the abstract order and the abstract operators. The abstract order should be sound with respect to the concrete order. And the abstract operator should also be sound. Okay, the abstract operator are defined by the counterparts of the concrete operators and they should, in some sense, commute, which means they should embed more behaviors than the concrete one. Let's do some examples of abstractions. Uh, for numerical values, we decide to abstract the set of valuations that we had before. 
we have two possibilities. First of all, we can abstract all valuation as a function from variable to power set of z, and then we abstract power set of z at some abstract domain. This means that because we do not rely on relationship between variables anymore, these domains are non-relationals, which means that the values of each variable are independent. And we will see first three examples, signs, constants, and intervals. And there are other possibilities to abstract all this set of valuations, which means that we abstract directly all the set of valuations as some abstract domain, which means that relational combinations are possible. The counterpart of that is that it's more complicated to design such abstract domains and they are more costly. Such examples are octagons and polyhedra. Let's come to our third definition. What do we want for our analysis? Let's recap. In our analysis, we were computing, instead of concrete value, an approximation of these values. And what we want for safety is that if we come back to the concrete world, then the value that we get is bigger than RK. Now that we have all these definitions, we are ready to begin to define our first abstract domains. We will focus on the non-relational domains that are the simplest to define. And so let's go. So I recall that we are abstracting set of values as firstly a map from each variable to a set of values. And then this set of values is abstracted as some shape in the abstract domain. In other words, what we will do now is abstract one variable, the values of one variable, and then all variables will be defined pointwise. Okay, so this is the definition of the definition of pointwise. Here it's the domain about all variables, and here is the domain for only one variable. The fact that it is defined pointwise makes it easy to define the order in the abstract domain from the order on the relying abstract domain, which, which is simple. I will come back to alpha and gamma later. And similarly, it becomes easy to define the union of two abstract values as the union of individual abstract values. Let's come to an example to make this definition concrete. Let's come now to the sign. I depict here a lattice of signs where the top is the maximum value in this lattice, bottom is the minimum value, and you also have three different non-empty values that are zero, lesser or equal zero, greater or equal zero. Let's begin with gamma, which is a concretization. Concretely, what does zero mean? Without any surprise, the concretization of zero is a set which is reductible to zero. Let's take another one. What is the concretization of lesser or equal zero? Without any surprise, this is all values between minus, infinite, and zero. So gamma is easy to write. Perhaps you can make a pause on the video and write the other values for gamma. So this is the concretization. For abstraction, be careful. Abstraction here, you should have a set of value, okay? How do we abstract a set of value for a given variable? Let's take this one. If a given variable is always equal to zero here, then its abstraction is zero. Okay. When a variable is always positive, which means that all the values in that are L, uh, that are inside S for this variable are positive, then its abstract value is positive. I don't know nothing. When there is no value in my set I want to abstract, and I get stop. If there are values for my variable that are possibly negative and possibly positive, means that I don't know anything about 
putting it inside this category so I could put, get the top. Okay. So be careful we abstract a set of value. Okay. But that's not because you have a set of value there that you don't do the abstraction for a unique variable. Here I make the abstraction of a unique variable. Okay. The set S depicts all the values for a given variable. What about properties? So we have to prove that the sound that the lesser if of equal defined here is compatible with the lesser of equal of the concrete world, which is not so difficult. And you also have to prove that the, there is a Galois connection between alpha and gamma, which means that for every set here, if I abstract this set and I come back, I get a bigger value. This is this one. Now let's come to some applications of the former definitions. Now that we've got the alpha which are and gamma which are specific to one point in our lattice, let's up these definitions in order to have a, de a definition of abstraction and intersection that are speaking about all variables of my program. So I recall the definition here, which means that which give us definition for the non-relational abstraction for x as a function that gives some information there. So let's come to x here. x is in the concrete world and it has values for let's say i and j. And the first step is to disconnect the each possible values for i and each possible values for j, okay, which means that, and here we abstract this set as top, and here we abstract this set as, oh, I know that it's positive, which means that here the function we are searching is i to top and j to greater than zero, also depicted by top and three thousand zero. Let's come to the intersection. Let's make the intersection of this abstract value and this abstract value. So we make it step by step. So the first component first. How do we make the intersection of I'm positive and top? So if we look at the as diagram, it means get the lower so the lower sum, okay, so here this intersection is positive. And j is now assigned a value which is the intersection of being null and positive. And here, so the result of it is zero. Okay, so the final value here is a map from i to greater than zero and j to greater than zero, which is also depicted by positive and zero. Yes, there is a light bit of abuse of notations. Functions are denoted by tuples. The other operations are left to the exercise. Now, what about expressions for my abstract domain? I will give the semantics of the expression inside this non-relational domain. So be careful, there is a typo there. It should be sigma. And also be careful, the sigma I am talking about is an abstract sigma. It gives an abstract value. So the semantics here of my value for expression is the value of its abstract value in the abstract world. Same for numerical constants. And the two next operations will be defined in the next slides. In the sign domain here, the abstraction of a given constant is a simple abstract value which is inside the abstract domain. And the definition of alpha is according to the sign inside the concrete world. For the random, we know for sure that there is no value if n1 is greater than zero, than n2, sorry. We know for sure that 
if n2 is equal to n1 and 0, then the abstract value is 0. And then we perhaps have the possibility to infer that the random value is negative or positive, or can be any value. Let's now come to binary operators. We are now defining the abstract counterpart of plus inside the sign world. What do we do if we know that we can be of any value on the right hand side and the left hand side? Pop, of course. What do we do if we know for sure that we are adding two positive elements? Without any surprise, we know that we have a positive element. I let to continue and use this table and make the same for the minus. So make a pause in your video and draw the table for minus. Now that we have expressions, we are able to define the abstract semantics of commons. So let's recap that the semantics of a common takes a valuation in the abstract world and should give a new valuation in the abstract world. Okay, so sigma here is a valuation inside the abstract world. Okay, so without any surprise, when I want to assign to V a new element here, an arithmetical expression in E, I have to evaluate this arithmetical expression expression inside the abstract world and modify the current valuation, abstract valuation, in order to put the new value for v. And now for tests, I let you make a pause in the video and understand why I make all here these computations. Let us make an example. I recall the formal definition and we are trying to apply this abstract transfer function on the test where x is greater than zero. Okay. So let's make the assumption that we had a sigma in the abstract world that was given a value for i, I don't know, don't mind, and a given value for x, for instance, and what we are computing is a new va abstract value for i and a new abstract value for x. Well, without any surprise, because we here the test is not speaking about i, i is unchanged. So that's the second part of my definition. And now what is a new value for x? First of all, I get the abstract value for the test here, which is I get greater than zero, greater than zero here in the sign domain. So I should make the intersection of the former abstract value and the new abstract value, which is less greater than zero. And the intersection gives the value positive or null, which finally gives us the new set of valuations, the, the new value, abstract values for i and x. Okay. At that point, because we have defined semantics of the of commons and we have defined the abstract union, we have all the mathematical foundations to cleanly define the abstract semantics for signs as the smallest solution with respect to the abstract order of the system of equations here, the set of mutual recursive equations that defines an abstract value from its the abstract values of its incident edges. Of course, like as usual, the set of initial valuations is now the top of my domain. I recall that we compute the abstract semantic of our programs from this set by starting from an initial abstract value and compute all new abstract values for all states of my program, for all control points of my programs from the previous uh, abstract state. 
and then go back to 2 until a fixed point is reached. At that step, we click clearly define all the elements of this fixed point computation, but we, we didn't prove yet that it terminates and we didn't prove yet that it's sound. This will be for the next video. Bye bye!